I just want to say as we get going that with nutrition and cancer, I feel like there's so much information out there and it can be really difficult to sort through it all and try to get a sense of what is meaningful or even true and what actually applies to you and what doesn't apply to you. And so that's another part of what I want to do to try to do tonight is to talk about things that we know about in terms of nutrition and cancer, but without losing the thread. And this is a really core belief of mine that food is meant to be enjoyed. So, you know, we can talk about sugar, we can talk about should I eat this or that. And and at the end of the day, my job is to make sure that you are able to eat to the best of your ability in a way that feels satisfying for you. You've all seen this before. And I think the most important thing as I talk about this is that when people see this and they're going through treatment and they have nausea or they have things taste like the bottom of a shoe, they look at this plate and they feel a light layer of pressure, right? How am I going to eat this way if I don't feel like eating, if I don't have an appetite? So what I really want to talk about today is while this may be the ideal, there's actually a lot of ways to get to good and, and quality nutrition without it exactly looking like this on a meal by meal basis. I want to focus here on the things that um, some of the most common side effects that I help patients navigate with, with small cell lung cancer. And the first of them is nausea. I would say that experiencing nausea, even low grade nausea, obviously there are medications that you might be taking to help manage that, but a few nutrition tips that can help are clear liquids like broth or fruit juice that's diluted, even a little bit of fresh lemon, piece of fresh ginger added into water or hot, like a fresh ginger tea that's hot or cold. The other two or three things that work really well when you're nauseated are dry, crunchy, salty things. Salt and potassium are the two things that the body needs to help suppress nausea. And salt is easy to think of foods that are high in salt, right? Saltine crackers, little oyster crackers, broth-based soups, and potassium-rich foods as well. Now, you're probably going to be surprised that in the first minute of a nutrition talk, a dietitian is telling you that if you're nauseous, potato chips actually work. Potato chips work because they're very high in potassium and they're also very high in salt. So it wouldn't be something I would suggest you go eat half of a bag of potato chips but if you get waves of nausea that come and go throughout the day, keeping a bag of potato chips, and I like to suggest Cape Cod potato chips, not because I live in Massachusetts, but because they don't use any hydrogenated oils and eating like three or four potato chips and waiting 10 minutes can often really settle a wave of nausea that kind of comes out of nowhere. So that's, a, you can have those little bags of Cape Cod potato chips in your center console of the car or in your purse or wherever, because you never know when you might, even if you're taking your nausea medications, when you might get a wave of nausea. Similar ginger, I have some people that keep ginger candy or ginger tea bags or, you know, ginger ale on hand, but those, these things, clear broths, dry, salty foods, potato chips, and ginger are things that work pretty well for nausea. Um, I had somebody that last week who said to me that she does bananas, which are high in potassium, with peanut butter and a crack of sea salt on top. She just cuts the bananas into little like chunks, you know, a little bit of salt, salted peanut butter, but she puts a little extra salt on top. And that's like totally works for her nausea. And it made sense to me when she said it. She's like, I do salted peanut butter banana. I'm like, that's, that's a sensible choice. Peanut, potassium and sodium together. Now let's talk a little bit about taste and smell changes. If you're noticing food aromas are really strong for you, you might keep fresh lemons on hand to slice and smell, or even just stick your fingernail into the rind to get a little bit of that whiff of lemon. Fresh lemon is a smell that tends to override all the other more powerful food odors. You can also take very tart juices, like an unsweetened cranberry juice or a pomegranate juice or an unfiltered grape juice, really quite tart juices, and put a little bit of juice like an ounce of uh, juice into a glass of water and sip on that. I had somebody the other day who froze real lemonade, froze it into little ice cubes, and then would put that in a glass of water. And then the ice, the lemonade frozen, it was unsweetened, would, would um, melt into the water and, and really help with the taste changes. For people who are experiencing metal feeling in their mouth, if you have metallic taste due to medications that you might be taking, 
silverware, especially metal silverware, can really exacerbate that. So it might be a good idea to transition to bamboo silverware, which is pretty readily available now. It's much more environmentally friendly than um, some of the plastic silverwares. We could talk all night about fatigue that comes along with treatment. But the goal in terms of how to cope with fatigue is to make sure you're adequately hydrating yourself and to eat very small amounts every two hours while you're awake, including protein every time you eat if possible. So when I say protein, for some people that includes things like chicken or tuna or cheese or yogurt. For other people that are doing more of a plant-based approach, it includes things like lentils or edamame or nuts and seeds. Um, those are all options. Very frequent eating um, is a really important step in, in terms of managing fatigue. This leads us into talking about what to do when you don't feel like eating. That eating very frequently is a really important way to try to eat if your appetite is really waning. That's because you actually can meet your nutritional needs in little tiny meals if you space them out throughout the day using smaller plates and bowls. Now let's talk about the smaller plates and bowls for a minute, because there's actually really interesting research that when people are going through cancer treatment, if they see a plate of food, like their usual size plate in their cupboard, with the usual size portions of foods they ate before, they will actually be able to eat less than if they have a small like dessert size plate with a smaller amount of food on it. And maybe that makes sense to you as I'm describing it, but the, the idea behind why this happens is that just seeing a plate, a, a typical size plate of food, just seeing that can increase the feeling of overwhelm and decrease a person's ability to eat in that moment. So whenever possible, choosing smaller bowls, smaller plates, you can always put more in there later if you're able to finish what you have in that small portion. But smaller plates and bowls can really be helpful um, as you're moving through treatment. Another thing that we often recommend as dietitians is trying to get every single bite to have the most nutrition as you possibly can. So I'm going to mention a few fats here, olive oil and avocado or avocado oil. So if you're making a sandwich and you're open to it, spreading the inside of the bread with avocado oil or olive oil, and then whatever you're going to put on your sandwich, right? So some people are putting another condiment on there, a mustard or, you know, cheese and turkey or tuna, as I mentioned. If you're making a grilled cheese sandwich, putting olive oil or avocado oil on the inside of the bread and the outside of the bread. And the reason for that is a tablespoon of oil has 140 calories that are heart healthy and anti-inflammatory. And they're just the kind of calories that can really help give a caloric boost so that you're taking that grilled cheese sandwich and you're just getting 160 more calories into that sandwich without having to eat a bigger sandwich. There are many people who ask about, do I have to drink a nutrition supplement? The answer is not necessarily. Some people like to have them for variety. And when I say variety, I mean, probably not necessarily every single day, the same shake or smoothie, because doing that tends to mean people get sick of this shake or smoothie in, in time. There's, a, there's a, a website I'm naming here called The First Mess. There are a lot of supplement and shake recipes that people whose tastes have changed because of treatment, like they think that they taste sickeningly sweet. You know, there's a lot of commercially prepared cartons and cans of supplements that I hear from patients. They just can't even look at them. They're, they make them feel nauseous. They're just, they turn their stomach. And what I like about these 20 recipes from the first mess, and you can see kind of by the picture here, right? They're all kinds of different things. There's blueberry, blackberry, avocado-based, pomegranate, carrot-based, spinach-based, and some of these are not savory and sweet but they're actually really delicious ways to get some vegetables in or to have things not be so fruity and creamy. That flavor isn't appealing to you. So there's some options here for shakes and smoothies. Um, we can talk more about that if people want. And then if you're experiencing a loss of appetite, it can be ideal to try to do your liquids in between instead of at your mealtime. Let me give you a, a concrete example of how this might look in a day. So if you were going to try to wake, wake up in the morning and eat a little something for breakfast, maybe a half an English muffin with some peanut butter on it and some orange juice. I'm just making that up. 
If you're a person who wanted to do a shaker smoothie, I might recommend you blend it up in the morning and then put it into three small little glasses that are like three ounces, you know, just little tiny, like a little bigger than a shot glass, right? And put those three little glasses in the fridge. And a half an hour after your meal, you drink that little shooter of smoothie, put that glass in the sink, go on about your day, two or three hours later, you eat a small snack or a small meal, and you follow it down with that little smoothie that you, little tiny smoothie in the fridge. Because doing those little liquids in between your meals, especially if they're nutrient dense, like the smoothie, can help with energy, unintentional weight loss, and it can actually help overall with the number of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and protein that you're able to get in during the day. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the GI problems that people can have. So let's first talk about constipation, and then we'll talk about the opposite problem, which is loose stool, both of which, quite frankly, half of my day-to-day was talking with people as they were bouncing back and forth between two extremes, you know, getting thinking they're getting it all straightened out and then having the other problem like in the, in the matter of a day. So First, I would say when it comes to constipation, the goal would be to eat high fiber foods. You can do some homework um, later today or tomorrow if you want to, like looking around even just the labels on foods in your house. So like for breakfast cereal, high fiber would be five grams or more per serving. I listed here some foods that have that uh, five grams or more of, of fiber per serving. It's things like brown rice, quinoa, lentils, dried beans, chia seeds, 100% whole wheat bread. Um, so those would be some of the types of foods to try to eat if you're experiencing constipation. It's important that vegetables, fruits, whole grains, as you increase your fiber, that you're drinking enough fluid. Otherwise, this recipe won't work, right? It's fluid and fiber together that really make a difference. I included a recipe here that works really well. It's for a homemade prune applesauce. It's stewed prunes, high fiber cereal. And if you if you know the cereal All Bran, All Bran works really well in this recipe. So you take stewed prunes, All Bran cereal, and unsweetened applesauce in a half a cup portion each, put them into a food processor or a high speed blender and blend it up. Think of it like um, applesauce, but a little bit thicker. And you can store it in a glass jar in the fridge for the week. And you just take a tablespoon of that mixture. You can take that tablespoon up to three times a day. And then, um, like I said, this is this is a remedy, a home remedy, if you will, for constipation. And I have a lot of patients who use this in addition to whatever stool softeners or laxatives their team has prescribed for them, but just to help things get get going in a bit of a more gentle way. Okay. And then again, if you're having the opposite problem and things are moving too much or too loose or too frequently, um, you may in fact have to go on a medication to manage that. And, or you may be able to modify what you're eating to help. So I'm gonna just show you really quickly uh, five categories of foods that if you're experiencing diarrhea, these things work. Um, oftentimes people are told if they have diarrhea, they can't eat fruits and vegetables. That's actually not true. Um, if you're experiencing diarrhea, there are certain vegetables and fruits that have the right type of fiber. You want soluble fiber. And the foods that are listed here are all the type of fiber that's gentle enough and the right type of fiber if you're having diarrhea. So I won't read them for you. You're welcome to take a screenshot of this if, you, if you're wanting this list for later. I'll leave it up for a moment more just to say that on the vegetables, these are things that are all cooked or canned, except for the avocado. Fresh avocado that's ripe is fine. It works fine. So like avocado toast, people often are surprised to learn that if they're having diarrhea, avocado toast is actually a good choice. You can have applesauce. You could have a, a smoothie, like I described in the previous slide, that's got berries and stuff blended up in it. And then this last slide I'll sh show you is just showing the protein, carbohydrates, and fluids that work really well if you're experiencing diarrhea. And I'm just going to leave that up for a minute too. If you want to take a picture of that, you're welcome to. And, and just know that with diarrhea, the goal is not unlike what I've just described, that small things often 
can really be helpful. I don't meet a lot of patients who have treatment-related or immunotherapy-related diarrhea, which is another issue. People on immunotherapy often find themselves sort of struggling to keep from having a lot of diarrhea. And I just find inherently they're not eating large, large amounts of food at one time because it's not so comfortable for them. You know, it's it's smaller, more frequent meals feel a little bit more um, possible with their digestive system. I hear from a lot of people who want to know more about if there's certain supplements that can make a difference, if they shouldn't be taking certain supplements with the with their particular treatment. And I will say that I've been I've been um, doing this a really long time, and for a long time, everyone was told just take no supplements, none at all. You know, avoid them. Then there was kind of a movement; people were taking all kinds of different supplements. I think we've now kind of moderated a bit. We have enough evidence now. I mean, the field of cancer nutrition research is going to be 50 years old soon. So we have enough research now to understand what might be protective. And it's not a very long list of things. You know, it's a pretty short list. Um, I would say vitamin D is one of the vitamins that some people do need to supplement. It's easy enough to find out if you need a supplement because there's a really reliable blood test that you can get to determine how how well you're synthesizing vitamin D. And Montessa, I love that you had everybody sort of say where they were from. I saw a lot of like people by Chicago, some people, a lot of Northern climates here. Some, some people a little bit more Southern, but I live up um, near Boston. And the, so now the Northern climates, like the Northern half of the U S un, unfortunately during the winter months, we live in an area where we are not going to get enough vitamin D from the sun. We're just too far from the equator. Even if you were out there giving it your best shot, it's you're not going to make vitamin D from the sun in from November until April. So when it comes to vitamin D, my recommendation would be to talk with your medical oncologist or even your primary care doctor, because the blood test is something that's typically done at the primary care of the general practitioner's office. And it's a quick one purple top tube, and they can tell you what your vitamin D level is. And if your vitamin D level is low, it's a pretty easy thing to supplement. And, and, and supplementation, some people say, well, I already take 1,000 or 2,000, isn't that enough? It might be, but I have met a lot of people also who, like I said, live in Northern climates and they've been taking 1,000 international units and they're still vitamin D, they're still a little deficient in vitamin D. Other supplements I get asked a lot about are omega-3 fats like fish oil, if you eat fish, you might not need an omega-3 supplement. The vegetarian versions of omega-3 are walnuts, hemp hearts, chia seeds, you know, of course, fatty fish. There's There are benefits to eating, you know, salmon and halibut and all the fatty fish. And some people like them and other people are, that's just not for them. Oh, and probiotics. That's the other one people ask about a lot. Probiotics can be a safe thing to take during treatment but not all treatment protocols will allow or endorse the use of probiotics. So you would, this is another example where really talking with your medical oncologist will be important. But the thing that probiotics can help, at least in my experience, is, is gas and bloating that can come along with treatment related stuff. So if you're, if you're if particularly for people that have irritable bowel syndrome before they start treatment, and then that gets kind of revved up, um, probiotics can be helpful. And, and if your doctor tells you that you can't take a probiotic supplement, you can eat prebiotic foods. And prebiotic foods are the what feeds the probiotics in your own intestines. And that's the fermented foods, right? So yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, anything that's fermented, if you like those foods, um, those foods really um, help feed the healthy, healthy intestinal bacteria. My oncologist tested my vitamin D level and it's good. Um, it's a good thing she did at a toxic level. Come to find out it was I was taking vitamin D supplement that was supposed to be taken once a week. I didn't realize that I was taking it um, once daily, 50,000 IU. <laughs> good that you checked. Yeah, good that you checked. And uh, another question. Do you know if, um, if it is true that turkey tail mushroom supplement will boost the immune system? This is a great question. So turkey tail is a type of mushroom and it's been studied 
primarily with breast cancer, actually, the University of Minnesota partnered with a naturopathic college north of Seattle called Bastyr University a few years ago to look at the effectiveness of combining chemotherapy and this particular mushroom called turkey tail. And the results were pretty interesting. I mean, this uh, Montessa mentioned that before I worked where I do now at, at Iris, I worked as the director of the and manager of the integrative medicine division at, at Dana-Farber. And so we had a lot of questions about supplements and their whether they were safe or not safe. And, and the turkey tail one always puzzled people because we don't know the exact precise dose. We don't even know exactly how it works, but the preliminary research on it at least used in tandem with a breast cancer protocol was pretty favorable. And here's the other thing. It is not known thus far to have any harmful effects. So while I can't give you like a prescription or an amount to run out and, you know, get, I'm only inferring based on the fact that you put husband in there that your husband probably doesn't have breast cancer. That's not impossible. Men do get breast cancer. But what the research has shown it's most effective at is 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 free is being used in in, um, in, con in conjunction with breast cancer. I wanted to speak to Lisa's other point though about her husband's oncologist saying it wasn't okay to take with his treatment because this is important. Supplements, you know, like they're all natural. We often think like, what harm could they possibly do? But for just a minute, I want you to think about your liver, and your liver is how your body detoxifies. And some supplements use what's called the cytochrome P450. It's a, it's a, it's like a super highway through your liver that sweeps out toxins out of your body. So let's imagine you're going in to get chemo or immunotherapy, you're getting treated for cancer, and that cancer is, is needing to get into the liver and get activated to be effective. What we don't want to do is be giving you large amounts of something else that might be sweeping it out faster than it could than it could do its job. So that just for you, Lisa, and everyone who's listening, if you hear from your medical oncologist that they don't want you taking a supplement of some sort, it's often because that pa the pathways in the liver that these supplements go in and like roto root their way through are the exact pathways that those oncologists are relying on being able to activate the drug. So it's like they could it's like they could sweep it out too fast. And I had a question. I think it was the loose bowels or one of them. You said, you know, canned fruits yeah. and vegetables, which, of course, the theory I always thought was, of course, the raw vegetables are better and not cooked so that all of the nutrients are coming out of them. What is the difference about the canned with the juices inside the can? Yeah, great question. The canned, well, and it could be fresh, like you said, Montessa, cooked fresh, totally fine, and frozen, by the way, frozen. cooked frozen vegetables. Or if I were to like sort of, I hate to do this hierarchically in terms of food, but like I would say fresh and frozen would be preferable over canned. The reason why some people can tolerate canned better than other things is because they, those fibers are more broken down. When I look at that list of veggies though, I'm just going to go back to it for a second because I have it right here. So asparagus tips, I don't know, you can get those jarred in glass, like canned like that. Avocado ripe would be fine, strained tomatoes in a can. So there's canned. Summer squash, you would probably not need to do canned, just fresh or frozen. Sweet mm -hmm. potatoes, fresh would be great. Peeled eggplant. Uh, there is some canned eggplant dishes now that are pretty good. Okay. Um, and those that would be an example of canned, I would say, might work. Fresh mushrooms work, and as would canned. Canned beets are like pickled beets or roasted beets. Green beans, I guess, canned or fresh or frozen. Carrots, again, probably fresh or frozen. So I'm glad you called that out. And okay, Montessa, back to you. Oh, good. What is the mathematical equation of how many calories like a person is supposed to intake? Ooh, and does it question. change if they're on treatment? Yes, it does. So that depends on a number of factors. Um, the basic, the most, most, I mean, there isn't really, I can't teach you the whole equation right now because it involves <laughs> thinking through like, what did you used to weigh? What do you like to weigh? How tall are you? There's a lot of things that we put into the, into the plug into the equation to calculate this. The fastest rough estimate you'll hear from any dietitian is to take your weight in pounds, divide it by 2.2 and take that number times 25 to 30. That's like the ballpark. Like if I were just to throw you some quick thing you could try, 
That's what it would be. And now, you know, I think as a responsible registered dietitian, I'd love to invite all of you to consult with the person like myself at your cancer treatment facility, because you're going to get a much more accurate number than you would by me just giving you that off the cuff idea. But, but to that point, calories, protein, fluid, calculating what you need individually is part of what we do as registered dietitians who specialize in cancer care, because those numbers do change based on your treatment. So you might have only needed 48 grams of protein before you started treatment, and now you might need 63. And and that doesn't might not seem like a big jump, but if you lost your appetite and things don't taste good, it you know it might be a little bit more difficult, and you might need a little bit of help to to get to that goal. You said take your weight divide by two point two. Yeah. Multiply times twenty five. Twenty five. Yes. I yes, came up you with uh, 1954. What does that number represent? Yeah, what's that number? I'm glad, you're, I'm glad you're walking us through the real life example, Jim. Okay, so the first part was taking your weight in pounds, dividing by 2.2 just to get it into kilograms. Yeah, 78. Yep. And then average person, if they're in a relatively healthy weight, like not too underweight or not too much over their ideal weight, if you're roughly where you want to be, then your weight in kilograms, Jim's like, nope. I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, Jim, but I am appreciating your willingness to do this out loud with me. I'm way underweight. Uh, before okay. cancer, I was 236. Now yeah. I'm down to 170. And okay. Four. So I look at walking stick these, these days. And there's a smile. I, I, you know, I'm appreciating you right now, Jim. So... <laughs> Here's what I would say, how we did that number. I'll just finish with some off and then maybe you can, you can chime in. So when we did the weight in pounds and we divided by 2.2, that was just to get the weight in kilograms and 25 to 30 calories per kilogram is a very rough way to estimate how many calories you need a day. And that's the end number we were getting to there. But Jim, just know this, that 30 to 35 calories per kilogram for you, if you're trying to maintain or maybe gain a bit of weight would be more appropriate. Everyone is is different. So some people going through treatment gain weight, other people going through treatment lose weight. So that's another big part of a dietitian's job is helping either problem because, you know, it's, it's can be really frustrating to have either one of those problems. Can I just say something to, to Jim? I was thin my entire life. And then after all my treatments, I was a walking skeleton. You guys have heard me say this before. I mean, I was, I'm, I've shrunk, but I was about five, seven and a half and weight was down to 114 pounds. Now, six years later, five and a half years later, I'm doing everything. I've got to lose weight. I mean, my oncologist is fine, but now I'm down to about five, six and I weigh 150, which I've never weighed before in my life. So I just want you to know, once you're through all this and you're feeling better and your appetite is better, trust me, you will put some of that weight back on. You will. (laughs) That's all I want to say. (laughs) It is really something, isn't it? The way you can have these like changes over the years. I just started the two hour interval like you talked about. I'm going to put the um, recipes in the chat, but Montessa, you can ask me another question while we do that. Okay, yep, we have a couple more. Um, And and it's kind of what you're talking about. I sort of have the opposite problem. I have gained 30 pounds. My oncologist said the cancer survivors can make control, um, which puts weight on. I eat very well and still (laughs) um, can't get rid of the belly fat. This Mm -hmm. also messes with my self-esteem, my energy level and other stuff. Anything I can do? I think you're not alone in this problem is the first thing I want to say, this challenge, if you will. Back when I was at Dana-Farber, I created a curriculum, which is a 13-week class for this problem. So I'm trying to think how to answer your question in a quick way. There's three things that really matter. Like there's lots of things. Like I said, I wrote an entire curriculum that's like three months long on this to help people because it does take time. But the three things that we know for sure make a really critical difference are not skipping breakfast. So some people will wake up and like there's fatigue. So they're waking up later, but then they might not eat till noon. So really, really key to eat something in the morning, even if it's something small. 
That's number one. The second one, I wrote this curriculum in tandem with an exercise physiologist who specializes in cancer survivorship. And her research is really clear that 30 minutes of movement, not marathon training, or get, her research is on walking, actually. 30 minutes of walking five days a week or however you can get to 150 minutes. So it can be 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, eight minutes there. It does not have to be all, any, any amount of ability to walk, but if you can get it to add up to 150 minutes of walking in a week, really key. The third thing is adequate hydration. So remember how I had you do that, take your weight and divide by 2.2. The thing is, if you've gained weight, the number is gonna be artificially high. But the goal would be to have you drinking, you know, like 64 or 68 ounces of fluid a day. Now there's the next one, which is three fifths worth of vegetables a day, you know, moving toward whole grains. So brown rice instead of white rice, the fiber slide that I talked about. But if I had to say three things, it's not skipping breakfast, 150 minutes of movement and adequate hydration. Those are the three things that are the first week of the class I taught that really kickstart people's metabolism. I'm definitely going to try that. Thank you. I mean, my problem is, is I don't, I've never been a breakfast eater and I work from home most of the time and I drink coffee after coffee after coffee. Um, I have started drinking more water. I've started making smoothies with like a protein, uh, okay. the vitamin, the pink probiotic, the pink for women. I don't know what yeah. it is. Yeah. What time of the day are you doing the smoothie? Um, well, I just started. So usually like around 11. Okay. Simply because I've never been, I mean, I'm going to try to push it back, I guess if I should, but I've never been one to, I just, I've never been one to get up and eat like. Okay. So one quick thing before we move on, I just threw the the smoothie thing in there, by the way, don't think you have to become vegan because I put vegan in there. The, the smoothies okay. are from a woman. The smoothies are in there. I hate, I, 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 I forgot to even frame that up for you. The reason I put vegan smoothies in the talk <laughs> I give on this is because some people don't do well with dairy and they end up with like all kinds of problems. Like dairy is not a problem unless it's a problem for you, but I want to be as inclusive not as I problem. possibly can. So if you don't have a problem with dairy, you can make your smoothie using anything you want. Um, wait, something that I wanted to mention to you, Linda, and this is for everyone, actually. When we wake up in the morning, our sleep wake cycles, you've probably heard of melatonin and the importance of sleep and I won't get into all that, but if you have gained weight unintentionally as a result of treatment, when you wake up in the morning, if you're, if you're able to eat something small, I mean like half a banana with peanut butter or like a hard boiled egg, it doesn't even have to be a big thing that teaches your metabolism that calories are coming in and it's, it's safe. We're in good shape. We're going to get, you know, if you, when you may wake up and not eat for several hours, the body thinks, whoa, we don't have anything going on here. We are going to go into housekeeping mode. We are going to slow it all way down. And that over time can make your metabolism more sluggish and make your disposition toward waking a little bit higher. So even if you can eat it a little, it doesn't have to be the first to hop out of bed and go right downstairs to eat. But within an hour, hour and a half of being awake, if you can eat something really small, that can start to help things move in the right direction, Linda. I'm not here to do a commercial. I promise you I'm not. But I do have a lot of fun with you all. So every other month I do a live stream cooking demo from my kitchen that's open to the public. It's not, you don't have to be a member of anything. You don't have to pay for anything. It's fun because we do recipes and it's all it's all cancer specific. So if you ever want to come, you're welcome to. So my Thank pleasure. You. I'm wishing everyone well. Thank you so much for inviting me.